Bruch Maboyan. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our house. The um, lecture tonight on my thoughts is uh, priestly garments. You know, this week's my thought will concentrate on the clothing worn by the high priest whenever he was present or ministering in the Holy Temple. I found it interesting that unless you are at a sporting event or a rock concert, somehow everyone seems to dress just a little bit different. Even before you say a word, your clothing has already said a great deal about who and what you are. It may tell others about your profession, what it might be, a policeman or a nurse. It may tell others about your faith, a Buddhist or a Jew. It may tell others about your ethnicity, your family's country of origin, the restaurants that you frequent, musicians you enjoy, places you vacationed, causes you support. Yes, even before you've said a word, many times you have made a statement about who and what you are. First impressions do make a difference. I find it interesting that Adam, first man, was created without clothing. It was not a necessity. It wasn't until he ate from the tree of knowledge that he felt a need to cover himself. It would seem that before the sin was introduced into the world, man felt no need to hide anything. Everything was real and upfront. With the sin came the possibility of lies and deception. There is a law in the Torah concerning the leper. The leper is a person who was punished by God with a skin disease for speaking lush and hara, uh, talking about other people. The law states that if, in the, the, if the individual is found to have leper signs on any part of their body, they are forced by the court to live outside the camp in solitary confinement. They, they do so until they are inspected by a priest and pronounced pure. However, if the person in question is infected with leprosy over their entire body, so then that they are not required at that point to leave the camp at all. Seems very strange. So if any part of a person's body is infected, they must be sequestered. But if all of their body is infected, then they are free to stay in the camp. How are we to understand this law? It seems totally illogical. If one looks at this scenario properly, we can see the pure logic of the Torah. The Torah is concerned that someone who spreads gossip about others may well be unknown to the populace. The gossiper just seems like everyone else making friendly conversation. There are no signs to tell us that they are gathering information about other people so that they can cause rifts among family, friends, and spouses. So to protect us, God puts a sign on their bodies to warn us to keep our distance from them. However, the person whose whole body is covered with leprosy, by his appearance alone, tells everyone who and what he is. That being the case, no one can be fooled into thinking they want to interact with such a person. People will automatically keep their distance from him. Uh, there's really no need for him to be sequestered. So we see that clothing can many times conceal what and who the person underneath the clothing really is. On the other hand, wherever we have a negative, we more often than not also find a positive. Clothing can be a reflection of goodness and purity. We see that the Torah tells us that dressing properly for prayer or for the Shabbat or the holidays is a mitzvah. Festive clothing helps us to put our minds in a festive mood. Uh, referees, judges, royalty all wear special clothing as a sign of respect. So I thought that it would be interesting to examine the clothing worn by the high priest, the most spiritual individual, he who represents the people while he ministers in the temple. Uh, there were eight garments that the high priest wore while he served in the holy temple. In the book of Exodus, in the portion of Tetzavah, beginning with chapter 22, 28, verse 2, God instructs Moshe to make holy garments for his brother Aaron, the high priest. He is told by God to make them so that they will represent both beauty and splendor. The physical beauty would be created by the artisans, and the spiritual splendor would be infused by God through Moshe, his servant. Not everyone is able to connect to the spirituality of the high priest, and that is why he wears such impressive clothing. It is a hope 
that these individuals who are not inspired by a spirituality may be moved by a splendor and exalted presence. Now the eight clothing, as they are listed in chapter Tetzava, are first the Choshen, the breastplate, which housed the Urim Betumim, the Aphod, the apron, the Me'il, the robe, the Ketonis, the long shirt, the Abnate, the belt, the Mitznefes, the turban, the Michnasayim, the pants, and the tzitz, the golden headband. These were the garments that the high priest would wear whenever he was in the holy temple. And just as Moshe had commanded the artisans, the priestly garments were magnificent, perfect in every detail, true physical beauty, flawless. So we see in a physical world we are motivated and influenced by physical beauty of the world that God has created and that man has embellished. The design of the high priest's clothing came from God, but they were fashioned through the hands of the artisans. The beauty of the high priest's clothing was meant to elevate both the body and the soul of the people who were in attendance. After all, we know the eyes are the windows of the soul, the gateway to spirituality. The high priest's presence was meant to inspire all the people that came to the holy temple. From the highest to the lowest, no one, no one would leave untouched after having been in the presence of God, his house, and seeing the high priest in all of his glory. Our sages tell us that all eight garments that the high priest wore atoned for sins that the nation had transgressed. The choshen, the breastplate, would atone for faulty judgment. The aphod, the apron, would atone for idol worship. The me'il, the robe, would atone for lush and horror, gossiping. The katonas, the long shirt, would atone for bloodshed. The mitznefes, the turban, would atone for arrogance. The abnate, the belt, would atone for sins of the heart. The michnosayim, the pants, would atone for immorality. And the tzitz, the golden headband, would atone for both arrogance and pride. The Zohar states that the four golden garments that the high priest wore are an allusion to the four-letter name of God of mercy, the yud ke vav -ke. And the four linen garments worn by all the Kohanim, including the high priest, are an allusion to God's name Adonai, a name that connects to our prayers. The first command that Moshe gave to the artisans was, Va'asu, and they shall make the ephod, the apron. The asu was plural. The only other item that was made for the tabernacle or the priest, whose command was stated in the plural, was the ark. This alludes to the connection to both the written and oral Torah. The two tablets resided in the ark, which alludes to the written Torah, and the ephod, the apron, housed the choshen, the breastplate, which contained the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. These 12 stones were made up of precious and semi-precious stones. Now, this was done purposely by God Almighty, so as to inform the judges that in Jewish law, a penny is as precious as a million dollars. The letters on the stones of, on the Choshen would light up whenever the high priest, on behalf of the nation, had a question that needed immediate an immediate response, such as, should the nation go out to war? This was possible since inside the Choshen, which was folded in half, there was placed what we call the Urim Vitumim. Now, the Urim Vitumim consisted of a special name of God, which was written by Moshe himself. This created a sort of spiritual battery a direct line of communication to God Almighty himself. The Kliyakar states that the Choshen was square, and as I mentioned before, it was folded in half. The reason why it was folded over, doubled, was to allude to perverted justice. Perverted justice is a double sin. First, it harms one of the parties financially by unjustly forcing the defendant to pay money. Secondly, he hurts the plaintiff spiritually by causing him to take his friend's money unjustly. Now, the Cleocher also writes that all the stones should be flawless. This is an allusion, allusion to the judges, that their decisions should be clear and lucid, that they should be like precious stones, where their insides are like their outsides. The Choshen, the breastplate, was connected to the aphod, the apron, 
The ephod is mentioned three times in our portion, but why? Basically, it was the most important of the four special garments that were worn by the high priest, since it housed, <clears throat> excuse me, the Urim Vitumim. Uh, it was their, so to speak, GPS, God Positioning Satellite. Now, the gematria of the word aphod, apron, is 91, which is the same gematria as the Hebrew word malach, angel. This gematria tells us that when the high priest wore the aphod, he was compared to an angel. On the shoulder straps of the aphod were placed the two shoem stones. On these stones were embossed the names of the 12 tribes, 12 sons of the sons of Yaakov, our father. Now the shock states that when Aaron would serve on Yom Kippur, that God would look down on these stones and remember the merit of the forefathers and Yaakov's 12 sons. In addition, the Alshuk states that the letters of the word Shoham can be rearranged to spell the name Moshe. So the two names, two stones, pardon me, may allude to the two tablets which Moshe brought down from Mount Sinai. Therefore, Avnesh Moshe, the stones of Moshe. Now the Er Mayim Chaim states that these stones are placed on the high priest's shoulders, and this can be an allusion to a father carrying his young child on his shoulders to hold and protect him from danger. And so too, the high priest, who was through his guidance and merit, protected the children of Israel from harm. Rabbeinu Bachai states that when Moshe came down from the mountain, he shattered the first tablets, which in essence also shattered the relationship between God, Moshe, and the children of Israel. By the high priest wearing these 12 stones, which were set in the Choshen, and that rested securely against his heart, he was able to recreate and, re, reuni have, and a, have a reunification of the relationship between all three of them, God, Moshe, and the children of Israel. Now the two stones were referred to as Avne Shoham, onyx stones. The Balatorim states that the gematri of the word Shoham is the same as the Hebrew word Haluchot, the tablets, gematri of 450, when the word Shoham is spelled out. Our sages tell us that each of the stones had six letter, six names and 25 letters. These numbers allude to our statement of allegiance and commitment to God, our Father, and His Torah. We acknowledge our commitment to Him with the prayer Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. This first verse of the Shema has 25 letters, and the second verse, Baruch Shem, blessed be His name, has 24 letters and we count the verse itself, is 25. The Aksav Yaqabola states that the names of the tribes would stand out boldly on these stones, as the Talmud in Gittin 29 points out, concerning the tzitz, the headband. It says there that the words that were placed on the headband of the high priest were not engraved into the gold band. They were raised, just like an inscription found on a gold coin. The Asnaim Latura states that the two stones were a reminder that the children of Israel would, so to speak, shoulder the burden of the two tablets by observing the Torah mitzvahs, which they represented. Now, the 12 stones found in the Choshen were referred to as Avne Miluim, literally that would translate as filler stones, which is very strange, since many of the stones in the Choshen were actually precious. So we learned an important lesson about humility from these stones that even though they were precious and semi-precious, they saw themselves as only a filler in the empty cavity of the Choshen. The 12 stones that were set in the Choshen had six letters embossed on each, each with the name of a tribe. Since the majority of the names of the tribes did not have six letters, they added a letter taken from the names of the forefathers and the Hebrew words, Shifte Yeshurun, the righteous tribes. So, for example, the first tribe's name was Reuven. That name has only five letters. So they placed the first letter, Aleph, taken from the name of Avram and added it to the end of Reuven's name, giving it six letters. Then with the tribe of Shimon, which only has four letters in the name, they took the next two letters, the Vet and Resh, from Avram's name and added them to Shimon's name to make six letters and so on. Altogether, there were 72 letters on the 12 stones 
which alluded to the 72-letter name of God with which he created the world. The Choshen housed these 12 stones in four rows, three stones in each row. This was seen by the sages as an allusion to the fact that there should always be at least three judges that will sit in every court case. God created the world during the first six days of creation. He did so only during the day, not at night. So six times 12, the hours of the day, is 72. As it states in Tehillim, Olam Chesed Yibone, that the world was created for kindness. The Hebrew word Chesed, kindness, has a gematria, a numerical value of 72. The Shach states that the 12 stones allude to the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 also alludes to the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 hours of the day, and the 12 hours of the night. And just like they all exist forever, so too the children of Israel will exist forever. Now the Choshen and the Hebrew word Nochosh, snake, both have the exact same letters. Both come to reveal that which is concealed, one through holiness and the other through the power of evil. Both have a numerical value of gematria of 358, which is the same gematria as the Hebrew word Mashiach, the Messiah. Both are focused on the same objective, one trying to bring the Messiah to the world and the other trying to prevent or at least delay his coming. The Katonis, the long shirt, was an atonement for the sin of murder. This is an allusion to Cain and his inferior sacrifice brought to God of the sheish, of the flax, which God rejected. The Cleocas state that God's rejection of Cain's offering and then God's acceptance of Hevel's sacrifice of a sheep awoke a feeling of just jealousy in Cain. This jealousy towards his younger brother brought about the first murder in the history of the world. Now the Hebrew word sheish also means six, which alludes to the six Ari Miklot, the six cities of refuge, which was an atonement for the sin of Cain, killing his brother. The Cleocker states that the high priest wore a robe that was called in Hebrew the Me'il. The robe was completely blue. Its purpose was to act as an atonement for gossip, plush and horror. The colored blue is connected to the sea, as it says in Eve. I prescribe for it the sea. My decree and set a bar and doors, and I said, this far you shall come, but no further. God has also set a wall and a bar for the tongue, the teeth, and the lips. And yet, we still speak about others. We have not learned from the sea that turns back when it reaches the shore. The Orchaim HaKadosh states that the hem of the Me'il, the robe, was surrounded by golden bells and pomegranate balls. The golden bells were set amongst the red, purple, and blue wool, and linen pomegranates, which muffled most of the sound of the bells. This teaches us three things. A, that man should not publicly proclaim his piety and holiness. B, that whatever part of his saintliness becomes public knowledge, he should consider it as only something minor. And this is why the bells were attached to the bottom of the robe. And then C, whatever is said about a person should be like a pomegranate which is so much more wholesome and precious on the inside than its shell would indicate. The Torah Shlema tells us that to Me'il atoned for the sin of lush and heart, gossiping. The cold, the voice, the sound of the bells atoned for the cold, the voice that spoke lush and heart. However, we also are told that the incense offering that was brought daily by the high priest atoned for lush and heart. So, so which is it? Now, the incense that was brought in the temple was to atone for gossiping that was spoken in private, alluded to by the fact that it was burned inside the Hecho, the building that housed the golden off altar. The Me'il atoned for Lashon Hara was spoken in public, alluded to by the fact that the robe was born by the high, worn by the high priest in public. The tzitz, the headband, Rashi describes as a kind of plate of gold, two inches high, extending on the forehead from ear to ear. The Torah tells us that it was made out of pure gold. On it was written the words, Kodesh Lashem, holy to God. Now the Zohar writes that the secret of the holy name of God that was embossed on the headband of the high priest was that it emitted a bright light. The purpose of this light 
was that anyone looking at it would experience a sensation of his face falling due to the awe of God which would overcome him at that moment. If he did experience this feeling of awe of God, then the tzitz would have performed its function and his sins would be atoned. Now the Kliyakar writes that the abnate, the belt, was 32 cubits long. Now 32 is the gematria of the Hebrew word lev, meaning heart. Its function was to atone for evil thoughts. Thoughts can even be more dangerous than actions, the sin itself. After all, once one has sinned, they are more often than not satisfied, and then they can push aside their evil inclination, at least temporarily. However, sinful thoughts will cling to their soul forever. So therefore, the abnate, the belt, was wound just below the heart, the seat of emotions, to act as an atonement. The eighth Sefer HaYitzhira states that there, were, there, there are 32 paths of wisdom. These correspond to the 32 tzitzit, which we wear on the four corners of our garments, eight on each corner. The word lev, heart, has a gematria, a numerical value of 32. There are 32 teeth in a person's mouth. This alludes to the fact that a person's mouth and their heart should function in unison. A person should always speak the truth. They should never be disingenuous when they speak. As the saying goes, words from the heart go to the heart. Torah begins with the Hebrew letters Bez and ends with the Hebrew letter Lamed. These two letters spelled forward spell the Hebrew word Baal, master, and, and spelled backwards, they spell the Hebrew word Lev, heart. The Torah is alluding to the concept that one should always be the master of their emotions rather than having their emotions be the master over them. Now, I found it interesting that God's name is mentioned 32 times in reference to the creation of the world. It is also mentioned 32 times in connection with the construction of the tabernacle. So we see the tabernacle was, in essence, a miniature world based on Rabbeinu B'chai. Now, the high priest would also wear a mitznefes, a turban on his head, Rashi calls it a, a kind of tall arch cap. Again, its function was to atone, atone pardon me, for arrogance and pride. Wearing a head covering would be a constant reminder, even to the high priest, the holiest man in the world, that there is someone, God Almighty, who is always above him. So we see that the clothes that the high priest wore were worn for much more than just to impress. They actually had the ability to help the nation to reach their goal of being a kinder and more forgiving friend to man, and a holier and more obedient servant to their king, God, our Father in heaven. The Eiffel de Robe, the high priest wore, without the vav, has a numerical value of 85. The same numerical value as the Hebrew word peh, mouth. We always need to remember that our clothes have a mouth, that before we even utter a word, People have already made certain assumptions about who and what we are, especially as Jews, and even more so in our houses of worship. We need to be aware of our mission in life and whose presence we are standing. God has put us onto this earth to be a light unto the nations. There has not been many times in world history where we were able to fulfill that obligation. But the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel, Schneerson of Blessed Memory, saw our time as one of those times of opportunity, a time in history for us to make ourselves and the world around us just a little better than it was before we came. And with that, maybe we bear it to bring in the coming Mashiach Sikhenu quickly and in our time. And thank you very much for listening. Hopefully now you have a better understanding and a better appreciation for clothes, especially those of the high priest. Uh, again, God should bless you with health and safety and uh, happiness. And again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for attending. God bless.